Welcome, everyone, to the VBC Bible Institute and podcast, and welcome back, finally, to another session for our course, Journey Through the Bible. I greatly apologize for the delay. It hasn't, <laughs> my my desire wasn't to delay in getting another uh, session recorded and another session uploaded so that you could continue your journey through the Bible. I know we're going really slow, but that's okay. I'm trying my best to produce uh, lectures that will benefit you and benefit people hopefully for years to come. So I'm really trying my best to give you something um, that I think will help you, give you assignments that will help you really dig into the scripture and really try to to try to get you to think and and process and and study and and give you the skills that you need for a lifetime of Bible study and a lifetime of helping other people do the exact same thing. I hope I hope the VBC Bible Institute podcast is really um I, I hope it's really helping you and hopefully you're sharing it with as many people as possible. I would really, really, really like to develop a large number of people who are participating and who are actively learning with us. So if you know anyone out there who you think would like to participate, please invite them along so that we can uh, really try to help as many people as possible dig into the scriptures and take a journey through the entire Bible. Now we've concluded Genesis chapter 4. And in Genesis chapter 4, I gave you an assignment. Now, no one has turned in their Genesis 4 assignment. Only a few people have turned in their Satan assignment. I know that was a big one. The Genesis 4 assignment, make sure you understand. Yes, I'm asking you to do a biographical study on all the people listed in Genesis 4 other than Adam and Eve. You don't have to do it for Adam and Eve, but all the other people listed in Genesis chapter 4. The reason I chose Genesis 4 is because the people listed, there's not a lot of information. So you can do a biographical method that won't be very time consuming. Don't wait until you, you don't have to wait until you finish your study on every individual. Just start sending the ones that you have completed so that you feel like you're accomplishing something. And I can see that process, uh, progress is being made. So please make sure you're working on that. Genesis chapter four, biographical method, jump in, do the work. It's important because the Bible is filled with stories about individuals and you need to have the the proper skills and how to study those stories by doing a biographical uh, study of the individuals mentioned so that you really know everything about them. You can live with them, walk with them, learn from them, learn learn what not to do, learn what to do. And and you see the reality of, 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 of these people trying to live out their faith in a very, at times, difficult world and difficult situations. And I think there's many lessons to be learned. But I don't want to go back to Genesis 4. No, we need to move forward to Genesis chapter 5. Now, if you've been listening, you'll know this is my third attempt to teach Genesis chapter 5. And I have decided now, after two previous attempts, that everything went horribly wrong, that in this attempt, I'm going to change my entire way of doing this because I believe There was something I wasn't really going to dig into, but now I feel like we need to dig into it, so we're going to do so, and uh, well, this may open up all kinds of, uh, this may may open up a lot of controversy and disagreement, but that's okay. Maybe this will benefit you, and and hopefully I can help you at least aware of the controversy, and then you can move on. So before we go any further, this is what we need to do. We need to stop what we're doing. I'm going to play Genesis chapter 5 being read to you. I want you to listen to it carefully. Remember, as you read, just think about what's jumping out at you you from the page. I want you to follow along if all possible. So open your Bible to Genesis chapter 5. And I want you to just pay close, close attention. And we're going to get into some very, very important issues. And uh, we're going uh, in the previous attempts, I basically taught all of Genesis 5 in one uh, teaching. That's not the way we're going to do this. We're going to start with kind of a, um, a, a very important topic. That I, and the reason I decided to, to add this to the teaching of Genesis 5 is because I think it's critical because it comes into play with how you're going to deal with, a large, with other parts of the Bible. So we're going to bring this all together. This is going to be beneficial. You're going to learn something. Be ready to ask questions. You can email me those questions at newsif at yahoo.com, newsif at yahoo.com, and uh, I'll be more than happy to try to answer those questions or work with you. All right, are you ready? Here's Genesis chapter 5 being read. Listen carefully. 
and see what uh, things jump out at you. Here we go. Genesis chapter 5. Chapter 5. This is the book of the generations of Adam. And the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them, and blessed them, and called their name Adam, in the day when they were created. And Adam lived an hundred and thirty years, and begat a son in his own likeness, after his image, and called his name Seth. And the days of Adam, after he had begotten Seth, were eight hundred years, and he begat sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were nine hundred and thirty years, and he died. And Seth lived an hundred and five years, and begat Enos. And Seth lived after he begat Enos eight hundred and seven years, and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Seth were nine hundred and twelve years, and he died. And Enos lived ninety years, and begat Cainan. And Enos lived after he had begat Cainan eight hundred and fifteen years, and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enos were nine hundred and five years, and he died. And Cainan lived seventy years, and begat Mahalalel. And Cainan lived after he begat Mahalalel eight hundred and forty years, and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Cainan were nine hundred and ten years, and he died. And Mahalalel lived sixty and five years, and begat Jared. And Mahalalel lived after he begat Jared eight hundred and thirty years, and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Mahalalel were eight hundred and ninety and five years, and he died. And Jared lived an hundred and sixty and two years, and he begat Enoch. And Jared lived after he begat Enoch eight hundred years, and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Jared were nine hundred sixty and two years, and he died. And Enoch lived sixty and five years, and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah three hundred years, and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were three hundred sixty and five years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And Methuselah lived an hundred eighty and seven years, and begat Lamech. And Methuselah lived after he begat Lamech seven hundred eighty and two years, and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Methuselah were nine hundred sixty and nine years, and he died. And Lamech lived an hundred eighty and two years, and begat a son. And he called his name Noah, saying, This same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands, because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. And Lamech lived after he begat Noah five hundred ninety and five years, and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Lamech were seven hundred seventy and seven years, and he died. And Noah was five hundred years old, and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. There you have it, Genesis chapter 5. Now, when you hear that chapter read, when you read Genesis chapter 5 yourself, Obviously, one thing is going to jump out at you. There's probably two things that are going to jump out at you, but one thing definitely everyone probably comments on, everyone notices, and everyone usually has questions about. These people lived for a very long time, right? The numbers, the numbers are going to jump out at you, and you're going to be like, wait, what? What is going on here? I mean, let's just look at them. Uh, uh, Genesis chapter 5, verse 3, Adam lived 130 years and begat a son and his own likeness and after his image and called his name Seth. And the days of Adam after he had begotten Seth were 800 years and he begat sons and daughters. And all the days that Adam lived were 930 years. Now you go through all the ages there. They're very long. And it begin, people begin to ask lots of questions. Well, wait a minute. Why did they live so long? How did they live so long? Or they may even ask, is this, 
Is this accurate? Is this literal? How do we understand this? And it begins to raise lots of questions. And and my initial thought was just to go, you know what? There's controversy here. Everyone has a different opinion, but um, that really misses the point of the chapter. The chapter has other points that are far more significant, but at the same, and so I just want, that was my original goal was just to kind of say, that's not really the main issue here. There's other important issues. Let's focus on that and move on. But then as I started thinking about it, I was like, well, wait a minute. In the Bible, there are going to be times where numbers and how to interpret numbers are going to become very critical to how you interpret it, and maybe even the theological system you hold to. So we at least need to raise the question here and try to figure it out because it deals a lot with hermeneutics. It deals a lot with uh, how this could influence the way we interpret other parts of the Bible. It raises lots of questions, questions about textual accuracy, uh, symbolism, numerology, all kinds of issues. So we're going to take the time um, and that, again, this was not my original goal. If you heard my previous teachings uh, where I attempted to teach Genesis 5 and everything went wrong, I'm going to uh, I'm going to back up and we're going to take the time. So here in part one and Genesis 5, that's all we're going to focus on are these numbers. We're going to raise lots of questions and I'm going to try to get you thinking and I'm going to point you to some different resources and hopefully you're going to really benefit from this. All right. But you're going to have to put your thinking caps on. All right. You're going to need your thinking caps on. I do not want to confuse you. We're going to have to try to work through a lot of uh, some of this. I'm going to try to not to get too technical here because some of it gets so technical and so, I think, convoluted that it's not helpful. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of come up to the edge and look at all of the right to the edge of where everything become, becomes very convoluted and crazy and difficult. And it becomes just so like, Nobody can even figure it out that it's no longer beneficial. But I think up till that point, there are lots of questions and things that are beneficial. So I'm going to try to take this subject and keep it in the beneficial side and not allow it to slide over there into craziness where all you're going to do is get confused. All right. I want this to really benefit you. All right. So when you read Genesis chapter five, you've got a lot of people listed who lived a very long time. Lots of years, 700 years, 900 years, these these long extended ages. And you're like, wow, like what what was going on? And there's lots of different approaches to it. But let me let me set this up for you. You ready? Before we can deal with Genesis chapter five, I want you to understand that you're going to come across in your Bible study and your journey through the Bible, certain sections of scripture where numbers become a very big deal. I just chose a few randomly for you to get an idea. We've already found one in our journey through the Bible. That's Genesis chapter one, all right? Because in Genesis chapter one, what do we have here? In Genesis chapter one, we have language like this. Uh, Genesis chapter one, verse three, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. There's day one. Then we go on to the second day, uh, Genesis one, eight, and God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. All right, so then we get into this discussion. You know the debate. Well, wait, that one day, two days, are these one literal 24-hour days? Or when it says morning and evening was the first day, it was morning and evening was the first time period of a long period of time of hundreds of years, thousands of years, millions of years. And people get into a discussion or get into a debate. Sometimes it's a discussion. Sometimes it's a debate. How do we interpret this? Do we interpret it as, as a literal one day made up of a literal 24 hours, or do we interpret this one day as being a period of time, whatever that period of time may be, hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years, whatever the case may be. So immediately in the book of Genesis, you are confronted with how to deal with numbers, how to understand numbers. Does one day mean one day or does one day really not mean a day? Does a day mean 24 hours or does a day not mean 24 hours? Does evening and morning reflect one 24-hour period or does evening and morning reflect, who knows, a long period of time? 
the debate will continue. It rages on. Everyone thinks they're right. Everyone thinks they're smarter, which really adds lots of frustration when you simply want to take a journey through the Bible and get to truth. So there's one very famous passage. Here's another one. When you get to the end of the Bible, when you get to the end of the Bible, guess what you find? Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. A thousand years. Well, is that a literal thousand years? Or is it a figurative thousand years? Is it a figurative period of time, an undisclosed period of time? It doesn't really mean a thousand years. It just means a large period of time. It's not an, you know, an actual, it's, it's just giving you an idea that it's a large period of time. It's not trying to be specific. A thousand years doesn't really mean an actual literal thousand years. So you don't take it literal. So when you start your journey in the Bible, you're confronted with periods of time, numbers, one day, first day, second day, and and people begin to argue, well, is that literally one actual day or is that a period of time? You get to the, you get close to the end of the Bible, you're confronted confronted with a period of time of a thousand years, and then people are like, nope, that's not a literal thousand years. That's not a literal period of time. So if, now here becomes the question, if the Bible starts with basically non-literal numbers and non-literal periods of time, and if the Bible ends with non-literal period of time and a thousand doesn't mean a thousand, well, then how do we interpret the verses in between that speaks of numbers and time frames? How do we do this? All right. For example, if the Bible begins with something that's not literal, when it comes to numbers in a time period, and if the Bible ends in Revelation 20 with something that's not literal, then what do we do when we get to say, let's go to um, Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, and we read these words, Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work, But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, in it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, uh, nor thy stranger which is within the gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Okay, so here comes the question. If the numbers aren't literal in Genesis, if the numbers aren't literal in Revelation, then how do we understand Exodus 20 where it says six days you're to work and the seventh you're to rest? Is that six literal days? Well, some people will say, yeah, well, Exodus 20 is literal. Okay, well, but what about Genesis 1? What about Revelation 20? Here's another famous time passage. How about Daniel chapter 9? How about Daniel chapter 9? Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Daniel chapter 9, 24, we read these words. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. All right, here's Daniel's famous 70 weeks. Are those literal 70 weeks made up of literal days, made up of literal 24 hours? Or is it not? That becomes the question. So you have these passages where people take different approaches. Some passages will say that's very literal. Other passages will say not very literal. Some passages they'll say are not literal, but then they can't really tell you what the not literal points to other than just an, an indeterminate amount of time. That can be any amount of time. You just throw in whatever you want. We don't know what it means. You just add whatever time you want. It can be It can be a million years, it can be a thousand years, it can be whatever. So how do we handle the Bible? This leads to lots of debate and confusion, and it really makes it difficult for the average person to pick up the Bible going, okay, so that day is a literal day, that week's a literal week, that's not a literal week, that's not a literal thousand years, that's like, how do I interpret all of this? 
they get lost and confused, which I find interesting because while everyone gets confused in debates and no one can agree on what these numbers and dates and time frames actually mean, they all want to yell and scream that the Bible is easy to be understood by anyone. Well, clearly not because no one can ever figure these things out. There is so much debate about it. Now, what some people do is they come along and they make some statement like this. They're like, well, the way to figure all of this out is 2 Peter chapter 3. <laughs> I don't know how many times people have made this argument to me. And it, you have to laugh. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. All right. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. You probably know the verse, 2 Peter 3, 8. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. Now, I don't know why people run to that that verse, but they run to that verse to say, this is how we resolve all of the time problems. See, that one day in Genesis is really a thousand years. But wait a minute. The text is not giving you a hermeneutical key and how to interpret days and times in the Bible. By that argument, then in Exodus, one day, you work for six days, you work for 6,000 years, and you rest for the seventh. Like, how do you even apply that? Over and over and over in the Bible, days are mentioned. We don't interpret them as a thousand years. Please note what this passage is saying. With God, one day is a thousand years, but a thousand years is one day. It cancels itself out, so clearly this is not a, a, a key to interpreting days and time periods in the Bible. It's not. It's simply saying that with God, he's beyond time. He operates beyond time. With him, with God, a day is a thousand years, but a thousand years is a day. He is beyond time. He doesn't view time the way you and I view it. This is not a hermeneutical key to go reinterpret passages that mention a day, a year, a week, or any time period. Don't allow people to say such nonsensical, crazy, broken, biblical hermeneutics. That's not the way it works. Okay, so let's just get that out of the way right from the start. So what do we do? Well, if Genesis 1 starts with controversy, if the Bible ends with controversy with Revelation 20, well, then clearly Genesis 5 falls right there early on with controversy, because you've got these 700 years, 900 years. Wait, are those literal years? Okay, well, how did you interpret the days in Genesis 1? Did you interpret those literal? Well, no, yes, no, no, yes, don't know. Well, when you get to Genesis 5, are these days literal? No, yes, they are, they're not, they're symbolic, they're allegorical. They, we don't know, uh, they're not accurate, there's mistakes, all kinds of, of debates start showing up here. So I want to leave, I'm going to read just a couple of thoughts, I'm going to just give you kind of an idea of how this all plays out. But I want you to realize this raises lots of questions, okay? And, and we'll, we'll try to summarize all of these questions and try to help you through this. But this is, I, I, you need to be confronted with this now in Genesis 5. I confronted you with this problem a little bit in Genesis 1. But I'm going to confront you again with it right here because this is going to, this is so key to the rest of the Bible because you're going to run into this problem over and over again. And, and, and I think this is very important. Let's go with just one, one commentary. This is how one commentary puts it. Some scholars have suggested that the ages are not to be taken literally. All right, stop right there. We've got some who believe Genesis 5, all of those ages, they're not literal. They're not literal. Okay. Well, if they're not literal, then what are they there for? And what do they signify? And who knows what they mean? And how do you know what they mean? Now, this becomes the problem. Hey, they're not literal. Okay, great. Then how do I interpret them? What, 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 what method of interpretation am I using? What do I do? How do, what do I come up with? You're going to hear some of the theories uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get into. We'll try to read them to the best of my ability. But uh, I just want you to realize, if they're not literal, wonderful, who gets to determine the interpretation then? If they're literal, then it's pretty straightforward. At this point in history, people lived a long time. Obviously, that changed. Some will argue they lived this far 
prior to the flood, which this would be in Genesis 5. After the flood, the ages began to decrease dramatically. And this is because the environment changed dramatically. That's a that's at least that's a reasonable argument. Because what's happening in Genesis 5? Everything before Genesis 5 is pre-flood. Everything after Genesis 6, 7, 8, and 8 is after the flood, and the ages start decreasing dramatically. The text would seem to support that idea. The text would seem, that, that's at least a textual argument. Just to say, hey, it's not literal. Okay, well, now you've got to explain how you're going to interpret it and what it means. All right. And how do how do we figure this out? What tool do we use? So back to this commentary. Some scholars have suggested that the ages are not to be taken literally or perhaps that the lifespans related not only to a person, but also to the family that sprang from his loins. All right. So some will argue, OK, the numbers may be literal, but they don't they don't reflect the age of one person, but they reflect the age of that person along with all the pr- people who proceeded from them, who they ultimately produced. All those who came from their loins, as the commentary says. It's, 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 not a comp- it's not simply giving you the lifespan of one person, but of an entire family who derived from that person. All right. That, that could make sense. Long period of time covering everyone. Okay. I think I think there's there's possibly some truth there. Um, others go on to say others wonder if years were calculated differently in those long ago days. OK, well, if if years weren't calculated the same way, then how were they calculated? And then what does that do with the rest of the Bible every time uh, it seems to give us any time time references in years? Then then how do we know when a year actually becomes a year and when a year is not a year and how do we calculate biblical years, right? At that point, you call into question everything because then what does it mean a thousand years then? If a year doesn't mean a year, when we get to Revelation 20, does a year mean a year? And and all the other references as well. While keeping our minds open to what researchers may discover in these areas, we need we need no reason to doubt that these men were probably an exceptionally hardy breed. So their argument is these people were probably an exceptionally hardy breed. I don't know how you get that. Okay, whatever. They're hardy. They were just stronger than normal people and they lived longer. Uh, the other question relating to the time which elapsed during the period is important. Scholars like Usher took these genealogies seriously when they tried to calculate the date of the creation They assumed, understandably, that the genealogies were complete and that if they added up all the ages of the antediluvians, and antediluvians is just a a word for meaning before the flood, antediluvians, they would arrive at an accurate figure for man's first appearance on earth. Modern science has shown their calculations to be inaccurate, and modern research has shown that the lists are by no means complete. We know that it was normal genealogical practice to omit what generations, whole generations, so that the person who begat somebody else could as easily be his great, 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 great grandfather as his father. Therefore, we conclude that while these are real men who lived real lives of a stated duration, we are not obligated to assume that the antediluvian period lasted for a period of time equaling the sum total of the ages recorded in Genesis chapter 5. All right. Now, how, what can we take from all of that? This is what we can take. Even if we take the, na- the uh, ages to be exact, even if we take the ages to be exact, it doesn't mean it reflects the life, the age of one person, but uh, an entire family that came from there. And even if we take the numbers to be accurate, we have to realize that in many cases they can skip entire generations for, uh, in, in a genealogical record where when it says this person beget that person, it's, it's not that this is, this is the father of that person. In many cases, it could be the great, 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 great grandfather of that person. So there could be gaps. Uh, we, we cannot in any way believe dogmatically that this is a complete genealogical record that we added up and we get the time period of creation and we can try to determine everything that way. That would seem to be naive and doesn't, doesn't really hold to what modern research has, has demonstrated. So that means most likely that the ages, right, are not the key feature here. 
the key feature seems to be some, there's another major issue trying to be articulated here, unless, unless all of this is just symbolic and allegorical. And if we can figure out the key, then we'll discover what it's symbolizing, what it's trying to picture, and then we'll all be wiser for it. However, to state that, where are you going to get that key to interpret it from is going to just come from someone making it up or coming up with some idea. But we, we will look at it. So we have to approach Genesis 5 at least that these are real people who really lived and who really died. It doesn't reflect every, most likely there's gaps here. Entire generations may be missing. And no matter what we do with those numbers, whether we believe those numbers reflect the life of one person, there could still be gaps. Entire generations could be skipped. Even, even, <clears throat> or, or we could say that it's not one person, that it could be entire families, but still generations could be uh, skipped. We don't, there's a lot of questions that we cannot answer. So we have to at least understand that probably Genesis 5 is not the chapter to take to start adding up numbers and saying, hey, on this date at this time, that's when creation happened, and this is how many years it's been. That's probably not a a good way to handle Genesis chapter 5. That's probably not a good way. But let's, let's, this is very important. One of the key issues is not there, one of the key issues in Genesis 5 is obviously not trying to get us a, a, a believing this is a complete genealogical record so that we can date back to when basically creation happened. Most likely, what we have, the, probably the issue that we have to address is are these numbers literal numbers or are they figurative symbolic? And if they're not literal, then what do we do with the numbers that come before it? What do we do with the numbers that come after it? after it? Or is this some weird anomaly that just shows up out of the blue, throws all these weird numbers that you have to then come up with some kind of clue to figure out how to interpret them? If this is some weird anomaly that doesn't impact the other books, you've got to explain to me why the anomaly shows up here. All right. What about any other genealogies that are listed? Are those the same way? Don't know. Let me let me go to a different source of information here. All right, a, a different article. This comes to us from uh, Dallas uh, Theological Seminary. Dallas Theological Seminary. All right. Um, the numbers in Genesis five appear to be actually long ages of the antediluvian patriarchs. However, many have taken note of the atypical extensive size, living over 900 years, this has caused many scholars and other curious people to plunge into finding out what these numbers actually mean. This paper, the one that I'm reading, is designed to present the various major issues regarding the interpretation of the numbers in Genesis 5. Realistically, the issue must essentially include numerical, literacy, rhetorical, cultural, historical, chronological, grammatical, geographical, and uh, um, uh, authorial issues besides many more probably, right? To interpret Genesis 5 without considering all of the factors listed above is simply an incomplete interpretation. So this paper is meant to reach a conclusion on a small part of the vast whole. It covers the numerical aspects of Genesis 5, followed by a brief evaluation of some noted literary factors. Now, I want you to hear that because this is very important. This is what happens when you get to seminary. Basically, what seminary says is, hey, you need to learn how to look at this text from a numerical, literary, rhetorical, cultural, historical, chronological, grammatical, geographical, and authorial issues from that perspective, and if you don't, you don't have a complete interpretation. All right, well, then guess what that means? That means the average person cannot interpret Genesis chapter 5. That means the average person can't do it because the average person would have to learn how to, how to look at it from all of those different perspectives, how to gather all of that information, and how to figure that out. Now, that's a major claim. See, right there, that's just, that's just shot right past in the paper. 
Hey, you've, you've got to look at it from all of these perspectives. If you don't, your interpretation is incomplete. You can't interpret it complete, uh, in a correct and a complete way. Well, that just removes the layperson from being able to interpret it. So who are they going to rely on? They're going to either rely on their pastor or they're going to rely on some experts from a seminary. Well, that, guess what? Then that means that there has to be an authority who can interpret the Bible and the lay people need to be subjected to that authority. Well, Protestants don't believe that. Protestants don't believe there's some special authority who can interpret the Bible. They believe anyone can interpret it. So then how do we work this? How, this raises very important questions. Now, either Genesis 5 is not as complicated as some people in seminary want to make it, and what we simply have is here's some people, it says they live that long, whether it's one person, whether it's uh, you know generations of people, that's not really the issue. They lived for a long time. End of story. But they died. The issue is they died. I don't think the issue is how long they lived. I think the issue is they died. That's the emphasis of Genesis 5. But yes, these numbers do raise lots of questions. So let's look at some things they offer up here. I'm just going to try to give you just kind of a taste of this. Sorry if I hit the microphone there. All right, here we go. Contemporary and historical solutions to the numbers in Genesis 5 show three categories of general interpretation. Literal, symbolic, and fictional symbolic. All right, so we'll go through these again. Literal, symbolic, and fictional symbolic. Among these solutions, there is also an interpretation that combines the literal and symbolic view. This view is literal symbolic. It's discussed following the symbolic view. So we have, basically we have, uh, we have the literal and, uh, let me make sure, we have the literal, symbolic, and fictional symbolic. And then there's also a view called the literal symbolic, right? So there's lots of different ways to handle Genesis chapter five. Historically, the most prevalent way to take these numbers is as literal ages. Keep that in mind. So the historical approach seems to be take the numbers as literal ages and move on. Any attempt to do anything else is only going to lead to nothing but mass confusion and chaos. Um, and I think if that, I think if we take that approach, then we have to take the numbers in Genesis 1 literal and the numbers in Genesis 6, 7, 8, 9, the rest of the Bible, right? Unless there's something screaming at us in the text not to. All right, so they said the most prevalent way was to take the numbers of literal ages. The numbers mean that they appear at first sight. The numbers mean what they appear at first sight to mean. This is reason enough for many. Some add reasons to this and hold that patriarchs needed to personally pass on future generations the wisdom and art they had learned. Such a, such a duty, it is said, could uh, not have happened during a normal lifespan of 70 or 80 years. Luther stated that these patriarchs also had better diet, more sound bodies, and experienced a less developed impact of sin on the physical creation. Some also proposed longevity based on the idea of a water vapor canopy, canopy that protected the earth from physical and genetically harmful solar radiation. All right, so bottom line is a lot of people just say, hey, these are actual numbers. They try to come up with a reason why they live that long. To me, that's just irrelevant. If you take the numbers literal, they're literal. I don't need to know why. I don't need to figure all of that out. They just did. End of story. They just did move on. That's the literal view, right? That's what it says. That's how we interpret it. Let's move on. And then you can offer up possible reasons. They needed to live that long to, to be able to hand out the wisdom and the things that they had learned to future generations. They lived that long because they had better diet. The impact of sin had not been around that long, so it uh, had not taken effect. Others say, hey, there was a vapor canopy surrounding the earth uh, before the flood. Once the flood happened, that, that collapsed. And once that collapsed, uh, solar radiation came in and started uh, hurting the body and uh, causing the body not to be able to last as long. You can come up with all the reasons. That's the literal view. Now, some will take that so literal that you they think you can literally add up the numbers and get creation. I think even if you take the numbers literal, you have to at least acknowledge the possibility of gaps and the possibility that this could just be giving you the numbers of, of 
the family that derived from this person and could be even skipping gen- generations and just trying to give you a general idea. You, you could go lots of different directions even within the literal view, but there's the literal view, right? However, there's some possible problems with the literal view. Here we go. Against the literal view, some factors are brought up to oppose a literal reading of the numbers. First, the numbers don't appear to be random. Each number in Genesis 5, except for Methuselah's 969 years, ends in either a 0, a 5, a 2, or a 7. Now, see, that. This is where you have to, I think this is where you start reaching. Hey, hey, th- th- these numbers don't appear random because all the numbers, well, except one, except Methuselah, he doesn't count. Well, wait, he's still listed there. But okay, other than that, all the numbers end with a zero, a five, a two, or a seven, which can be thought of as a factor of five. And at times adding seven, five plus seven equals 12, implies that the chance of this happening without deliberate alteration is essentially impossible. All right? So they're saying that this is this this appears that uh, the numbers don't appear to be random and for them to be structured the way they are seems to be uh basically impossible without deliberate alteration. All right? Maybe maybe not, but okay, even if that's the case, what does it mean? What, what do you is that is there some secret code? That I need a decoder ring to figure it out? Like, like what, what's, what do I do with that? Um, they go on to say, some feel that the definition of year was different in this context and should rather mean month or day. For example, Methuselah at the age of 969 years would instead be only 969 months or now 81 years uh, by the new figuring a more reasonable age in today's standards. Using this definition, though, uh, places the numbers into even more severe problems than than at the outset. The issue uh, loses weight, too, just by the context of Genesis 6. Um, uh, They they name an individual, agrees that a year at the time was still about 360 days. Um, The basic issue of greater human vitality is not enough to explain these ages. So some want to try to say the year should be interpreted as month or day, but that doesn't seem to really work when you get to say Genesis 6, where it seems to be that a year is about the time of 360 days. Okay. In other words, you get into more speculation. So the argument is, hey, they're literal. And the other, or the the first view is they're literal. And the argument's coming back. Wait, these numbers, they can't be random. There's something, these are not random numbers. Okay. Well, congratulations. What does that mean that they're not random? What does that tell us? Okay, well, a year, these, these should be uh, as a month. Okay, but that could cause problems later on. Okay, so then how do you determine what they mean? How do you determine what they mean? The biggest problem seems to be this. We have the Masoretic text, the Septuagint, all right? The Septuagint, and we have what is known as, um, I have it written down here because I always forget the name of it. The Samaritan Pentateuch, all right? So we have these three texts, the Septuagint, the Masoretic text, and the Samaritan Pentateuch. Supposedly, these three texts, they don't agree on the ages here, which raises lots of problems. Back to this paper, all right? They state this. Taking these numbers literally would also require reconciling differences between them and the Masoretic text, the Septuagint, and the Samaritan Pentateuch. The totals of the ages in these are, in the Masoretic text, 1,556, and the Septuagint, 2,142, and the Samaritan Pentateuch, 1,207 years. To solve the dilemma, some suggest that there were artificial that, that there was an artificial scheme that was developed for these texts. Dealing with this difficulty, some contend that those 
who redacted Genesis did not look upon the ages of the patriarchs as historical data, but used them to develop systems with different purposes. What then is the system? Some suppose a varied use of chronology and different calendars by scribes of the different text traditions. This, however, does not solve any difficulty with the size of the numbers. All right, that's even if you try to say, well, okay, these they these they didn't see these numbers as being accurate, so they used them for their purpose, but we don't really know what the purpose is. So we don't we don't be, both all three would have long not I mean. 1,556 years to 2,142 years and 1,207 years. Those still are all long periods of time. So that still doesn't fix the problem. It just raises the question, why are they different in those, those different uh, manuscripts? Well, probably some textual variance is what I, I would assume. Uh, they said, although taking the numbers at face value seems most appropriate, as in our present culture, the general size of the ages leads many to reconsider their validity as actual ages. The solving of the Masoretic text, the Septuagint, and the Samaritan Pentateuch number differences seem to contribute to the difficulty of seeing these numbers as actual ages. However, there are still many proponents of the literal interpretation of these numbers. But again, even if you say they're not actual ages, then what do you... What do you do with them? All right, the symbolic view. Now, oh boy. <laughs> okay, many also propose a symbolic use of the numbers. To lay the foundation, some state that there is enough evidence for this in Scripture that it couldn't have been coincidence. Some states that there is a, a biblical kind of idea for number symbolism. Some of these matters are in relation to the prevalence of the number seven and ten, known respectively in diverse and ancient uh, Near Eastern texts for their perfection and complete completeness. The list of 10 names in Genesis 5 has caused many to see an undoubtedly deliberate construction of the names to fit the scheme of an optimal 10-generation pattern, which then le- lend an authentic ring to the genealogy. Some, uh, some argue that the symbolic use of numbers starting a, a stating that playing with numbers, uh, the magic of certain figures and symbolism of certain dates was nothing new in chronology in the Bible. Others contend that some of the foundations of this system are weak. He cites the missing connection between the strength of historical content of the Old Testament and the use of this system that seems to take the history lightly. So they go through all these different ideas, trying to figure out what it is, and no one really knows. All right. No one really, no one, no one really knows what it symbolizes. No one really knows. You can, there are all kinds of articles out there trying to say, well, it could mean this. It could mean completeness. It could mean perfection. It could like, they're just throwing ideas out there. So here's the problem. If there's something in the text that seems to scream, this is not literal. This is symbolic. Well, then if the text doesn't give you any idea what it's symbolizing, what it's pointing you to, then it's of no value to say that it's symbolic or allegorical unless you can tell me what it means. Right? That's, that's very important, right? They go with the literal symbolic view. They state this, some suggest a system of figuring the numbers based on a knowledge of Near Eastern king lists and, and used a, a certain kind of number system. Um, Base 60 rather than the decimal base 10. The figuring for this is essentially based on the Sumerian king list, which is a list of kings who reigned before and after the flood. In general, the number of some of the Sumerian text shows uh, kind of this drawn to the number 60. Because of the age longevity comparison and the genealogy of Genesis 5, scholars search to find a way to link the Sumerian method of reckoning numbers to the biblical text. Using the number 60 as a starting point, proposals have been made on how the large numbers of Genesis 5 were actually to be seen against the backdrop of the Sumerian numerical system. Despite the interesting appearance of correlation, the numbers between the two texts heated disagreement exist as to whether or not the system of figuring can be adequately used to explain the numbers in Genesis 5. Now, please note, once you say that there's fierce debate and arguing, then what? what's the point? What's the value? I mean, where are you going to get from it? Bottom line is, 
You can read on the internet, and this this article goes on forever. We could we could read article after article after article after article after article, and you're just going to get theory after theory after theory after theory, and you're not going to get anywhere. So here's what I would say. This is very important, and and this is and and I know this isn't deep, and you're going to be like, well, this is what I get for listening to a. Bible Institute on the internet instead of going to a a big seminary. Well, I just read you a paper from a big seminary that it's not going to help you. That's just going to lead to confusion and you're not even going to know what to do with Genesis 5. So here's what I'm going to say. All right, this this is, I think, is very straightforward and very easy. Here's how you approach, approach a number in the Bible. When you're reading the Bible and you see a number, your first thought is to treat the number as a literal number, a literal period of time. Unless, listen to me carefully, unless there's something in the text itself that seems to scream at you, wait a minute, this is not to be taken literal. This is not to be, this is to be taken figuratively, allegorically, or symbolically. If there's something in the text itself which screams at you that this, this is not to be taken literally, then, only then can you can you start trying to figure it out. And I will argue that in many of the cases where you could argue that maybe it's not literal, there's enough clues to give you some idea of what's going on. But if you if you don't have those clues and you start trying to assign some kind of symbolic meaning, here's what you're going to do. You're going to be the one figuring out the symbolism. You're going to be the one throwing out the literal fulfillment of it or history. You're, for example, Revelation 20. Well, I don't believe Christ is going to come back and rule and reign for a thousand years. I don't believe that's literal. Okay. Well, then what does a thousand years mean that he reigns? Well, it just means a period of time and he's been ruling and reigning since, uh, since his death, burial, and resurrection. So we're literally in the millennial kingdom right now. And it's not a thousand years. It's just an indeterminate period of time. All right. Well, that means you say how easy that is. Doesn't have to be, you just throw in any number you want and say that's fulfillment. Okay, well, what gives you the right to say that that thousand years is not literal? Like, where where did you get that from? Now, if you've got the other numbers in Revelation, are any of those numbers literal or just not Revelation 20? How do you interpret the numbers? The problem is the minute you start getting away from a literal interpretation, you open the door for speculation. And when you open up the idea for speculation, you end up with confusion. Let me say that again. When you throw out a literal interpretation, you usually open up the door for speculation, which usually ends in confusion. You only throw out the literal when there's something screaming at you, hey, all of those numbers in Genesis 5, those aren't literal ages. Okay, well then what, then what are they? Well, I mean, there's this interesting, you know, not, uh, they're, 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 they're not random. These numbers are chosen because, you know, all all of them end with this number except for one. Okay, well, the one, doesn't the one throw out your theory? All the the, uh, numbers end, all the ages end with one of these numbers except for this one. Okay, well, that one causes at least some flaw. And please note, it would be one thing if every age ended with the exact same number. But they had to pick four, I think four or five different numbers that they could end with. Okay, well... I mean, come on. I mean, look, I don't know. I don't know if they if they rounded up. I don't know what they did. Here's what I know. No matter how long they lived, they died. That to me is the meaning of the text. No matter how long they lived, they died. Because death is the, this is demonstrating the reality of the fall. But everyone wants to get caught up in the numbers. So I just want you to hear that there's all these different views out there. I will argue that, and again, let me state it again. You go with the literal unless there's something in the text that you can point to going, mm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure here. I'm not sure. And and I would think anything that we can find in Genesis 5 that may raise a question, it could possibly raise a question of, is this trying to be a very specific genealogy, including every person? Or is this just trying to give us a general view of of different people and and who they and some of the children they produced and that they died like is it just trying to give us a general idea i think it's trying to scream at us 
hey, remember that promise that people are going to die? Well, we're getting the fulfillment right here in Genesis chapter 5. We're getting that. I, I think that's the emphasis there. So, all right, I know I took a long time on this, but I at least wanted to get this out there and get this at least thrown out there to you. Please note, there's thousands of articles with all kinds of wild-eyed speculation. This is a rabbit trail that you could get, you could go in and you're never going to come out. I have no idea. When the Masoretic text, the Septuagint, and the uh, Samaritan Pentateuch, why there's disagreement. But these kinds of things happen with numbers in the Bible and textual variants. It does. The bottom line is we have a list of people who lived. We believe there were literal people. They lived for a literal period of time. And they died. That's what I can be dogmatic about. Getting into wild-eyed speculation about supposed, you know, uh, allegory symbolism that you can't even really pinpoint what the symbolism points to. Or, oh, well, I think they're using a different numerical system. And I think they're borrowing from the Samaritan uh, list of kings. Well, that's just wild-eyed speculation. I don't believe this year is a year. I believe it's months. And, And that, that's, that's not helpful. We go with what we know, and what we don't know, sometimes we just don't know, and we just have to accept that. All right, I'll stop right there. You can give me your thoughts um, on all the po- passages in the Bible that deal with time and dates and years, and I think you're going to realize the more you start down trying to question this, you're just going to end up in wild-eyed, crazy confusion and conspiracy theories, <laughs> and who knows what. So give me your thoughts. Newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. Oh, that was a lot of information. Hopefully that was beneficial. Let me know. Please let me know. Any feedback on this will be great because I need to continue on in Genesis 5, and it's been a rough start to Genesis 5, but I at least wanted to get all of that out of the way. Next, the next lesson, next session, we can just jump into Genesis 5. And we can, uh, we're going to look at just some very key features that I think really drives on what the chapter is really about. All right, I'll stop right there. Everyone have a great day. Continue to read the book of Genesis and continue to let me know any questions or struggles you're having because I'm here to help you. God bless.